She's an absolutely delightful individual. She's been staying with me at the house for the past three days, and we've just had um, a great time. Um, Roberta comes with a, a, a wealth of experience with Satsuki azaleas, as well as other bonsai. And uh, so join me in, in welcoming Roberta. with 
the bands, you're stuck with the major lens, but how you treat it, if it doesn't have seven bends, it's a reject. It doesn't, because seven bends are a Buddhist symbolism of seven steps to heaven. When these are in full bloom, they sell them like mad to, uh, to uh, people of the Buddhist religion or for some holiday that I'm not that far into to those type of that I really didn't know. So so what we get are those that, that one bend came out of <laughs> came out of it or they had a couple too many bends or it was something they couldn't sell or it was something that that uh, somebody came by and said, Oh, I have a whole bunch of guys that meet the meat is alias. And he says, oh, a good way to make profit. So <laughs> here we are with trees that we can't, we don't have the knowledge here to develop. And so it's a good thing either way, both ways. This is a tree that John did this year in March. And, uh, and this is how most satsuki should look like every three years. It's kind of a shock. <laughs> but, but this is how you get heavy branches back in by, by uh, letting them grow. In this, in this method, the energy goes out to good, strong branches. It doesn't go to branches that make well, those branches that make flowers, but you keep cutting it off. And and this is satsuki. It's a lot of clip and grow. Something that I learned a long, some book back in about the 1960s called it a lingam clip and grow method, Chinese method of doing doing uh, trees. And so most of this, the the reason the wire is on with wire on here. It has stressed the cambium layer, and uh, it, it breaks back, clear back on, on even on the wood. So I'm going to set this down someplace here, and we're going to talk about this tree. I want, what I'm trying to do is prepare you for shock. <laughs> This is a nice little, and when I was looking at it, I didn't mark it, yes, I did too. I didn't either. A, a very chubby trunk tree with a nice, really nice spread at the bottom of the tree, nice trunk, and fairly decent nabari, but it's a short, fat tree, and not too much attention has been paid to the initial branching. So we're going to have to start this with initial branching. And because there's so many branches, I sat over at Ken's and looked at this all part of one afternoon to see where to start these branches and how to cut them if you are. And, and the varieties of satsukis that you don't have to worry about, the ones that you get from, from Sharon, because the ones that are imported are ones that are ideal to bonsai culture. There's almost 1,500 variety, 1,500 different colored satsukis. And some of them are from different families and only about 30, somewhere between 30 and 50, are really suitable for bonsai that can take the cut back, that can take the pot culture, and all that other things. I can tell you about, I can tell you also about some kurumis, which is that pretty little red one over there. But there's a variety of kurumi that is just outstanding, but is won't take pop culture and almost won't take ground culture. It's a, a more trivial sport or something. Do I want to? Oh, yes, I would like to have a turntable. 
And the stuff that stirred up this tree. Let's start the history of this tree to start with. It was a cutting. In a, some place, you know, in, a, in an azalea nursery place. And it was a cutting. Within three years, they expect that cutting to be three foot tall. It doesn't reach that far now. Then, after the third year, it is put around the stick and the bends are made, put around the bamboo stick and the bends are made in it. And it's placed out in, uh, in uh, this first three years, by the way, is in a, it's in a greenhouse where there is no movement, where the temperature is kept never lower than 48, never higher than 65. And, and there is no wind to shake it. If anything comes out on that, uh, any side branches come out on that, they're knocked off. How many of you make plants from cuttings? Uh, okay. When this, when this azalea comes out and they're going to take cutting wood off of it, the only, the strong center cut is used. Because a cut taken from, let me see if I can find somebody here that's willing to sacrifice. A cutting taken, nothing here south far enough. A cutting, here's two fairly good ones, and here's one. But if you take this good center one that's several inches long, after it's grown several inches long, and this is the center one that's in the center of the other two, or other five, this one will guarantee roots on all sides of it. The one that's taken from the side, like this one is, taken for me from the left side will only grow roots out here on the left side and if it puts any out on this side it will be minimal they won't be all the way around <coughs> so when Gondo is out looking for trees to buy he can tell which one where on the tree this cutting was made whether it was out of the center cut or whether it was out of the side cut because commercially they don't care what the roots are like. As long as it's growing a tree and then they're going to give it its, when it gets so far along, it goes to the <coughs> celebration. So there are a lot of things um, that may apply. Think of that or keep that in mind when you're making cuttings off of anything else that has more than one, you know, more than one area right there that you make a cutting. If you have a choice, take it off of the center sprout because it more than likely will, will uh, have roots all the way around. <coughs> this one is so compact. Now, the other thing I want to tell you is I am cutting all of this green off at approximately five millimeters from the end of the brown wood. And the reason for that is it has, it will have, see the little, and on, on that one of the jobs, it's starting to sprout out already at the end. But see the, the uh, little bit of green that's left here, even if it's cut? <coughs> if this green is out here on the end, 100% guarantee that it will break back along this soft branch. If I cut this off here and just left the brown stump up out here, somewhere between 20 and 40% chance of, of it breaking back. And if you only have 20 to 40%, that means 60% chance that branch is going to die back to the next joint. So that's that's why this, those little teeny stubs of green are all out there. 
I'd like to get into this so I can show you where we can cut it. Because these, you know, uh, I'm sure Sharon's had this one, by the looks of it, at least two years. And the other thing is it's growing in a, in a hot house that most of you don't have access to. So this one is out a lot further than, than what you have at home. And I'm doing this so it's like what you have at home. Hopefully like what you have at home. And when I get in here, I see that I've left a lot of, of uh, growth, a lot of fine things that are, that are, that are young and green. And one of the reasons for it, when you have when you have a young tree, younger than what's up here, but also see all these little fine twigs that are in here. The more leaves you have, and the more twigs you have when it goes into dormant season, the more nutrients are stored in the trunk. And so you don't prune it in the fall because you want those nutrients to back down in the truck. And a short, fat tree requires a broad base. A tall, skinny tree, a skinny trunk tree needs to be tall and a narrow base because all of its energy went up there. This fat one is here and short. Uh, not in here far enough to start styling that branch. So here we go up a little higher. Now when we get to the top of this tree, we aren't going to prune it as severely as we did down at the bottom because satsukis are bottom growers. All of are bottom growers. Uh, you do this just opposite of what I'm doing if you're doing a Japanese maple. And there's another study that Mr. Gondo has just done on his own trees. And that is when he repots anything in it in anything that's in a clay or clay type container, something that's a little bit porous, he never goes back into the same container as he took the tree out. He showed us slides that showed the growth every year of the, of the root system. And the root system that went into a pot that hadn't been used for a while, for a year or so, that had been allowed to air out, the roots grew out to the edge of the pot the first year, down the side the second year, and filled in the third year. On pots that had been used before, the roots came within a half an inch of the side, and there they stopped. They didn't do anything else. And his theory and what he sh showed by testing was in the fermentation of the ground and the fertilizer that used to do the uh, trees, a gas was formed that penetrated the pot. And he couldn't find anything that would wash it out. But if you left it set for a year without a tree in it, it showed no signs of the gas in the pot, then the tree grew out to the edge of the pot again. That's a good sales tactic for a pot seller, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Except being gone, there wasn't selling pots. And when you're a student, you've got to be a full faith believer. I mean, why am I going to, you know, uh, when you're a baby and you're walking, and your mom says, be careful, you're going to fall down. 
after two or three falls, I believe what my mommy told me about going to fall down if I'm not careful. And so I'm at that stage with Mondo. Things haven't worked for me as well as I wanted to in the past. And I am paying him good money to tell me what I should be doing. And the other thing he flatters me. <laughs> I am one of those vain females. He looked at me the first year I was in there and he said, I want students to teach bonsai. He says, I can't come over and teach his teach all Americans satsuki. So I want students who will go teach satsuki. And my first, and, and I was a first year student, and he said, none of my second year students want to teach satsuki. And I'm sitting there just off in oblivion, just as happy as can be. And he says, Robert, you be teacher. I looked at him and said, nah, I'm not a teacher. <coughs> yeah, be teacher, Robert. Ah, no, I'm not be teacher, but he keeps at me. So here I am. <laughs> and I have learned so much. What I'm doing right now is, is uh, I have cut off some of these things that we're going to use this when also we are no longer, I'm no longer concerned with left, right, front, and back. As long as it's even around and and goes up the tree and you can see part of the trunk. If we have bar branches, make sure that you keep one of them cut really back short so that the other one can grow on whichever side you want. But you probably need that one that's short on that side. And the only reason you don't have bar branches is it comes up, we split our nutrients this way, we get a knob right here. So if we control this one and let this one grow, we aren't going to get that knob. Forget bar branches. Just if you need it, keep it. Supposing you have a sharp fat azalea with a columnar trunk, columnar trunk that doesn't have a spread at the bottom. How do you make it spread? Well, how you make it spread is you bury it, like this one we needed wider roots, the better navari. You're going to bury it in finer soil than, than this is in the bottom, but a little bit finer soil, clear up to here. So that these roots are kept damp and soft so they can really expand. And then you make sure that the roots in the center and underneath the ones you want to expand are, are back short so that, that the top roots are the ones that have to pack the nutrients and have to suck them up. And so if they're soft and you're requiring them to keep the plant growing, those will swell. Another thing is when these things are dug, ooh, there's that ugly thing. You will find this quite often. They cut it off, they didn't pay any tin, and that was all they wanted. They sold it. Uh, somebody else is going to style it, and you don't want to do too much until, until they get a hold of it. So this one was a real healthy, strong, nice, exactly what you want, but it grew straight in the air. So I'm going to have to do something with that because it's just not going to do here. My only problem is it opened up this bare top too much. But we aren't going to care too much about that because we're going to grow stuff back in. She called that. Feels like I didn't know these trees grew to look like branches. Straight out there. Bert, does it matter um, when you're talking about letting the pot sit for a year whether you're talking my 
mind uh, for, for uh, ceramic pot? I don't think he had micropots to deal with. So I can't really give a good answer on that. I know that I prefer micropots to grow in. Because where I am, it's hot. Without a doubt, it's hot. I don't know anybody that will dispute that. And micropots will, will keep, they don't get as hot as clay pots when the sun shines on them. And by the same token, in the wintertime, they don't get as cold as clay pots. So if I'm growing something and I still want it to look nice and I'm not, you know, I want it to look like it's in a bonsai container and I'm not doing, taking it to a big show that has a lot of the know-it-alls in it, I'll put it in that micropot. If, if, you know, and if I want a colorful pot, uh, it'll have to go into a colorful pot that's about the mica size. I can do a little bit of fudging to get it in there, you know, for, for a show. And when it's, when I have the opportunity to, to protect the pot, sure, I, I prefer azaleas in, or any deciduous tree in a beautiful glazed pot. They're nicer for me to look at in the yard. They're just all together nicer. But, you know, sometimes you've got to sacrifice health for nice. This is really tweaking. The other thing that I'm going to tell you is I'm going to have to get some space in these branches somehow in between here or move them because this flower is going to be about this tall. And when it flowers, I want it to either be standing upright or facing out toward me a little bit. I don't want it crunched underneath a bunch of branches. And if it's crunched underneath, uh, Someday we'll have satsuki shows where they're judged for flowers. Mm -hmm. And they have them in Japan where they grow them just strictly for flowers and just for flowers. So they're judged just like the flower show is. Perfectness of the flower, the perfection, the nearness to, to species type, and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. But also, if you're doing it, you want it to fit that own criteria in your yard. You want it to look exactly like it should. You don't want it to flower and have some flowers that are dying on it while others are living and you're supposed to be pruning it when, it's, when the flowers have just reached their peak. Well, these have reached their peak, but this one hasn't even started to bloom. You want it all to bloom at the same time so you can show off. And there is a trick also to that. If they all bloom at the same time, you look at it when it's, when it's starting, the buds are starting to open, and you go in, and when there's three buds, you take out the weak one, take out the strong one, you leave the middle sized one, you do that all over the tree. When it flowers, it'll go boom. Everything is open at the same time. Here, here is one that's about to bloom up here. I'm going to cut this off. And see, I told you about Satsuki's having uh, the new growth around this flower, never cut <coughs> this growth off to show your flower. Because your flower needs this growth to pull all the nutrients up here to make it true color, to make it true size, and all that kind of stuff. 
Then when it's finished blooming, you take out this flower when it's finished blooming, and you take out all but two of the new growths like this. Then before June, you come back and you cut this tip out. And that will create two more branches. The next year when you do this kind of pruning, like this, after it blooms, then the following year is this kind of pruning. If you had, as you can see, this year we only had one cut. Next year we have, at this summer we have one, two. So our one has doubled. Next year when you do this other cutting like this and take re removing the unnecessary ones, you're going to have one, two, three, four times what you had to cut two years, a year ago. So if it took you an hour to cut it, a year, cut it back a year ago, it's going to take you four hours to cut it back this year. <laughs> I'd like to make an announcement that uh, Glenn is back there selling the raffle tickets and the can is up here, so you can see what a beautiful tree we have. And you can see that it may not bloom this year. If you talk to me, if you talk to me real nice, up here in the top are a couple of blossoms. What color aren't they going to be? <laughs> this is Kozan, uh, page 17 in the book. We have to remember to start at the back on these things. It's an, it is probably, Kozan is probably the most popular one in Japan because it's so hard. And it should be white. I don't know what I was going to... 17. <coughs> she said her book is different than mine. Okay. It's pale pink. Is it pale pink? Yes. I think uh, there are jasmine shades. Is this pruning technique uh, generalized to all azalea or this? <coughs> it is, it can be somewhat on coronies mm. if you do it earlier than now. And yes, coronies, what is it? Oh, yeah, go uh, ahead. in your book it's 803. Uh, yeah. And, um, it's kind of creamy color. It's a creamy pink. Oh, another thing that I want to tell you about, about Satsuki Zellias, they come in three different types of leaves. From the northernmost part of Japan is a narrow leaf variety. Uh, and the narrow leaf variety is the hardiest of all the varieties. They can stand cold, they stand freezes, a whole bunch of things. The ones from the very north. The middle, and those should be started this time of pruning in February. Or maybe up here for you guys, early March is good. Then the mid-size, the little rounder leaf one, goes down about another three weeks to mid-March, early April. And the broad leaf ones are usually the ones with the larger <coughs> flower and the rounder leaf. They're not as hardy. They're, they're uh, down south trees in you know, southern Japan. They're not as hardy, and uh, but you don't start pruning on them until mid-April, May, or June. And this, this is a uh, kind of 
close to a mid-sized leaf. It's still a little bit on the north side. And it's extremely hardy, so I would consider it a north tree because it's so hardy. So this has the smallest flowers. Yeah, this has has some smaller flowers. There, this one fits in the same class if you know Osaka Suki. It's got small to big flowers. And if you'll notice, I'm not cutting any unnecessary branches off of the top because Satsuki is bottom growers. It puts all its energy closest to the roots. And so you have to be a little more careful up here in the top and not do so much. Oops, did I hit that flower? Oh yeah, I can show you the guy. And don't be intimidated thinking, oh, there's so much to know about azaleas. I don't think I want to do them because they're too hard. I'll tell you something. They're no harder than your juniper. You should know as much about your juniper as you know about Satsuki Jin. Junipers have more bugs. They have more root difficulties. They have just a lot of other things. Yeah. Do you remember what Donald Sun said about if you have two bone sided and one is a sock here and one is something else? The percentage of your time that you have to spend on the sock here is about 75%. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you need to be good for one side? <laughs> That's what he says, but you know what? On the juniper, I have to wire all my air branches. On the satsuki, I just cut because it's going to grow back next year. <laughs> Maybe the better Yeah. And I'm going to be sure that they're going to grow back next year. If I did this to juniper, I was not too sure I'd get something coming back. Now, I'm going to set this in front. When they plant put poppies trees when they come from Japan, what looks like front may not always be front. Because, because they put them in the pot the way that they go in the best, uh, they, haven't, they don't have time to look at all this nonsense. And there's that flower. They, and they don't have time to uh, pay attention and decide. You're the one that's going to design it. <coughs> so after it's done, you can determine what the front is. And that's an individual thing. Where I think the front is, you may not like at all. Not at all. I like that for the front, but I'm going to have a little, I'm not going to worry about the apex because you don't want spot sinkies. It's just up there. It should be covered in green. Everything that's up here at the top is uh, going to have a blossom. It's not getting shaded by anything. One of these things that you don't want to be talking with neighbors while you're doing it. It's a little too much concentration for me anyway. Is there anything that I can help you with? Well, on that uh, point that you mentioned that the uh, pumps should be rested for a year uh, after taking the sheet on that. Is he only did it on azaleas. I went home and pulled out a couple of Japanese maples that I had 
that weren't growing, weren't putting out tertiary plant branches like I thought it should. And I went home and took them out, and they'd been in the container two years. And the root system on the top was, was back about half to a quarter inch from the edge of the pot. I don't know if that meant anything or not. I just know that it wasn't doing quite as well as I thought it should. And they both got back to the same pots they came out of. And I'm, you know, and none of us, this is the other, none of us are professional growers or, or do this as a profession. Or very, and if we do, we're growing it for somebody else to come work on. So we don't know what happens over a five-year period or a ten-year period. We don't have a group like 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 Nakayama has a group of ten students that he's had for ten or fifteen years that are out on their own now and get back together and compare what happens to this stuff. So. So I'm basically thinking I'm going to have to go with somebody else's experience. And if that's what he said, I might try it for a year or two. And if, it, and if the other ones are doing fine, I'll go, or I don't have a pot right at that moment. Now, is there anybody in here that has fewer pots than they have plants? <laughs> I don't see a single hand for some reason. <laughs> So there's not too much harm in trying it out. No, I may be, I think I got close to seven times more pots than I got plants. <laughs> when you had a three-year training period in the greenhouse, is it field grown? Yeah, from there it's sent out to the field and it's field grown in Canuma because that's a popular thing right now and because that's what they have the best success with. And it's field grown. The other thing is, you'd be shocked if I told you this tree is two years old. In Japan, this tree is two years old because its age is not counted until it's in a container. A 25-year-old tree and a 10-year-old tree Two years in the container is still a two-year-old tree. Because the conditions that you need to treat this tree is, if it's 10 years old, you need to treat it the same way as you did a 25-year-old tree. It needs the same cutback, it needs the same branch development. So they call a tree two years old when it goes, when it goes in the pot. The first year, it's a one-year-old tree. It's a baby tree. It needs to be taken care of. It needs to develop roots. It needs to learn how to grow in this pot. And it's a one-year-old. I don't care how long it's been grown in the field. It's been put into an entirely different dimension. It needs to move, learn entirely new lessons. Roberta? Yeah. Tell us about the air layering on its edges. Now, if you're going to call the trees over you keep looking at it thinking, well, it doesn't have seven or eight bends. I can take it off here, but I don't want to lose the top. Is it, um, I don't suppose in Japan they may do that very much. They air layer lots of things, but do you have any experience with that? Yeah. And, and that's something else, too. Let's, let's bring this tree of John's up because this one doesn't have anything. Before I tell you about this, I want to tell you about when they, when they take this out of the field. When they dig this out of the field, any branch cuts that they make will heal over immediately. Because it's in the field and it's really robust, you, you take this when it was in the field and touch it and pick it up, and it's like taking hold of a baby's leg. It's soft, it's pliable. This trunk is soft and pliable. When they dig it, and by the way, they dig it in pure frozen ground. When they dig it and take it into the to where they're going to thaw it and 
get ready to ship it. This trunk is still full of fluid and stuff. When they cut it back and go to ship it, what makes all of these, all of these, uh, what I call muslin, is this this trunk because it's no longer got all those roots that it can suck off of has to do something to take care of its own up here. So this trunk, the water lines shrink and become smaller. They still work, but they shrink terribly because they, they need only to supply the branches that they go to. So that's why a lot, a lot of this mess went. See this tree right here where this I call it a pillow where it looks like it's pillowed over and it's taken something and poked it in it and made it pillow up. That is because this branch shrunk faster than the water line that was feeding it. So that water line just kind of, like my excess on my tummy, sorry. <laughs> it just kind of folds over and it's still taking care of this. In 20 years in the pot, this branch will gradually grow and fill that spot, and you won't see that pillow. So, so when you see that pillowing in this stuff, it's because those water lines shrunk in size enough to take care of its own. But if you do it in a container, yeah. Okay. You want to take a break, John? Oh, okay. I mean, Ken. If you would take a large branch like this off, totally off, this tree in 10 years, the size of this, this branch is, the size that this branch is in, four years, either one of these would die. About six years, this is going to be dead. Or clear up to here, if these are on the same water line. If this tree has twisted and the water line is, you know, gone over to this side, whatever is the next branch on the water line above this will be dead within two years, even if it's this one. Because you have cut this, you have destroyed what was coming up and what this one can't take, it's a bottom feeder, remember? What this one can't take, it lets it flow on up to this one. But you took this out. So there's no need for that water to come up, that fluid water to come up to this. And so not enough has gone up to this one. And Mr. Gondo brought us a tree with pictures that he had of contests that had been in Japan. It was a fantastic tree. The owner had paid about $12,000 for it. At the show, one of the judges said that would have been a better tree if it didn't have that big branch off to the back. Nakayama said, don't you dare cut it. Gondo said, don't you dare cut it. But he had another bonsai master who said, oh, next year you can win the contest if that branch is off. So he took it off. We got it six years later down at El Dorado because not because God had bought it from him and because he has good enough financing to do it. And we went through a process. He talked to the tree. He bowed to it. He said, you're a very sick tree and you're lingering in life. And he said, we need to understand your health problem. So if you will excuse us and forgive us, this is it, Harry Carey. <laughs> and he cut it off like here. This was, and this was just full, beautiful. Took a fine tooth saw and cut it off here. Showed it to us. The part of the cambium layer was dark, and there was a dark, a beige section where the rest of it was white in that in that cutoff piece. And then green all around here. Well, who worries about that little teeny short section here? He went down and cut it off, and that short section went 
probably halfway across. Then he went down below the dead branch he cut. And it was considerable across. And when he got down here to where this branch had been cut off, he cut it below it and he cut it above it. And there was very little difference here. There was only maybe a quarter inch of lifeline in that Cambium layer up there because this had all died down from removing that large branch. Now, that can be overcome. You don't remove the whole branch. Say we wanted to remove this branch because it's easy for you to see. We would remove this piece, we'd remove some of this, and we would leave a branch with a little bit of green on, just a little bit. Enough so that when this water line came up here, it would go out and feed that one, and that one might jump out of my own. That's okay. But while it's doing that, it can't absorb everything that's coming up to it. So that water line will break into the other cells and start going around. And so next year, you take off that long piece that grew out here a mile and cut it back to only one leaf and leave it again. But when it comes out this year, it's going to be weak and grow only short. When it's weak and grows short and this branch above it is just flourishing lovely, then you can take this branch off. Then, then you've got it there. So back to the air layering process. I like from here up, say, for a show me from here up, a nice fat little show me. Yes, I can air layer this top off if I put this tree back in the ground and I've brought the branch up to make a new apex. I can layer this off and this is back in the ground so it can gain more strength. I put it in the ground a year before I air layer. Then this is gaining strength. I can take this off and the strength coming from down here will, will <coughs> balance it. But I can only take the top off. You know, it, I can't air layer a, a side branch off. <laughs> Do you have two tops? Do you have two tops? And so, not necessarily, because the bottom, the closest to the ground piece, will put out roots. But the next piece up doesn't have enough strength, because this one down here is cut off. And this one doesn't have enough strength in itself to put out the roots. Usually you can't air layer two, two things off of one branch, one here and one straight up, even on the top or anything else. That's the most common that I find. Do you, do you do that much air layering then? But you can't, you can't air layer this and this. Well, I think it depends on how much foliage you've got on each section. section. Because that's what's feeding that new work system. So, as long as you don't end up with water up to the front. So, I was wondering, do they recommend just shooting the wire or just stripping the bark? Or, you know, when they, or where I, they are? I don't really know that because, because uh, what Gondor deals with is he goes out and has finance in it buy what he wants and sure, sure. But, the, but the other thing I'll tell you, should I tell him Mr. Nakayama? Gondo will kill me if he knows I told him. Mr. Nakayama paid five thousand dollars for a tree that he thought was just absolutely gorgeous. And and the green and the green one that the big show in, in uh, Japan. And he got it home and decided he was going to take it from where it was and put it in the ground, only to discover it didn't have any roots. 
Oh, if you're stuck here by it's been Japan, beware, he said. If you think you're going to go over there and buy something from one of those sales that really looks good, they can pump it up so well, and this happened to be an accident of some sort, and when they were, when they were digging it, they, they had done it minus root, but that man wasn't going to do without his money. So he took it to the conference office. <laughs> That's like the tree that Gamora had in that book. That Jennifer that wound up being dead except for the air layer, the little sprig up in there. So he turns it upside down and carved it. Yeah. They probably paid a lot of money for that plant. And I shall tell you about the tree that John Knopf was doing in a workshop. And he'd gone around and this guy wired it. He was wanting to pot it. And John looked at it and he said, came over and he made a mark on the soil ball and he says, get a saw and saw it off right here. That was this plump. That was here. <laughs> that, that was here. That was Bob Hemlock. It didn't happen more than once there. <laughs> <laughs> so he saw it off. Get that root out of there. <laughs> we're going we're to go ahead and take a little. Along the lines, 
you want the same amount of taper in your branches, degree amount as you have taper from the bottom to the top of the trunk. Here it's going to take a long time. <laughs> Did I hear you say in five years you sort of let it bloom once? Yeah, in five years it will bloom once. <laughs> yeah, three, three years for it to bloom, two more years of cutting after it's bloomed, two more years of cutting back first to this, then to the tree, the first tree that was up here at John's. And then in six year, the sixth year it'll bloom. For that reason, make sure you got two socks and keys of the same variety so that every couple of years you can say, oh yeah, that was my favorite. <laughs> that way you won't look at the neighbor and say, what variety do you have? I need that. So what's left to do here really is, is a lot of wiring. Oh, thank you, John. John is a great idea to get skinny. I've got this for him. <laughs> the most considerate fellow who gets in class. He wants to go off here. In reality, as you can see, the major flow to this tree is to the back. Was to the back. No, I've tried to alter that by putting a wire here. Probably bend a little more today by bringing this to the front. And that's things you'll have to do when when you buy and say, you've got to go, I mean, that's half the fun. You buy a juniper, you know, one gallon can, and I'll kill you if you come to my workshop with a juniper in one gallon can. Totally kill you. <laughs> Where's one of our new members that knows the new new members that knows about that? He gave a great fight. He come packing eight or six or eight little six eight dollar plants like this, and he says, "Do you think these will be good for folks?" I have to make fun of him. <laughs> and I looked at him and I said, "Not until you're past as old as I am." <laughs> I said, "Why are you spending this much money for a baby? Something that has juvenile roots." <coughs> it's going to die anyway. And Dad will tell you about that. Started. How many pine trees did you start? Now you've got 30 left? About 10. 10 <laughs> Because there's a tradition. You know, some of them are weak. You know, whatever. They look nice in those four inch pots and those gallon cans the first five years. You know? But they go to trunk like this. They're, they don't know where they're going to go. Let somebody else take that in. Buy something that's got a nice trunk, that's been worked on a little bit. Next year, he's going to have something in the pot that will look like it belongs in a show. And he can show his friends, I have a bow side. And yes, he does. He doesn't have a stick that has struggled in half of a night. Don't bring a gallon can to my class. <laughs> and I, I was really grabbing with a gallon in our class one day. She came in packing stuff in four inch pots. And I said, You know, when you signed up for that art class in college, and they told you to bring a number two pencil and a sketch pad, did you show up in the middle of toilet paper? It's cheaper. There's a lot more on it. You can do a lot more drawing. <coughs> and they'll do that in my class. And it's 
It's a shocker, but it's the truth. You know, when you showed up with that sketch pad and that pencil, you did not expect to get the value. You didn't expect to sell your first picture and get $2.95 to pay for that sketch pad. You know, that's, that's all in learning. So when you buy, when you come to a bonsai class, bring something you can work with. And if you don't like it, I bet you money there's a club sale and it'll come back to bite you. I know about that. Just last week, this American show in Sacramento, this guy comes over and he grabs my daughter and says, come look at this. Isn't it pretty? It's a root over rock elm that she sold six years ago down there at the club. And it, he had brought it out of all of its faults that she didn't have time for. And he says, don't you wish you had it? And she said, I wish I had it now, but I don't want to spend the time that you took to get it there. <laughs> you know, but it was really nice. And it, it came back to my machine. It was really, really a nice thing. And you wonder, why in the world did he sell that? Went over to Santa Rosa and judged a show. And I told them that after it was judged, they don't let you know who it is ahead of time. I said, who do, can you tell me after it's done who that tree belongs to? Oh, yeah. They told me. They said, uh, in fact, I see the guy walking down the aisle out there. He's going to go look and see. He said, you, would you like me? I looked out there and I said, no. <laughs> she said, well, why not? And I said, well, I know that fellow already. I'll go talk to him. He sure did a wonderful job of that Japanese maple. I don't know where he found something so nice. <laughs> and I said, no. I said, how did you get such a nice tree? He said, you sold it to me. <laughs> I felt bad about getting a champion for that, for that class. Anyway, anything else you'd like to know? The rest of this is really boring because it's wire and, and some wire isn't long enough. And, Roberta? Yeah. What kind of a fertilizing regimen would you use? Um, oh, this. Yay, hooray. Fertilizer is almost as controversial as soil. Let's start off with soil. If you buy, excuse me, if you buy an azalea from Japan, it's grown in Kanuma, do not change the soil. Do not try to put it in fur bark and the other good stuff that they grow in the ground here. Because you guys, you people know Johnny Uchida from California. I think he's been up here before. When Johnny Uchida came to the United States in 1944, he went to work in some truck yards for, for a farmer that did cantaloupes with a whole bunch of other Japanese fellows. And he went out into the field and they served you breakfast, lunch, and dinner, and you would feel bad. You can ask John. He said he has never been so sick in his life. He thought he was going to die because they fed him bacon and eggs for him. <coughs> he was used to rice and green tea. They fed him beef for dinner, and he said when he was used to a little bit of fish, and some rice and noodles and green cabbage. And he said, he said, changing to the food that they fed them there, they couldn't work. They were just sicker than dogs. The same thing with your cities. Changing the content of the soil they're used to growing into will make you sick. They might survive. They might not. If you have a nice established bone site that has been growing here and started here and is in a soil that drains exceedingly well, 
don't change it to commitment. I was shocked when the author told me not to change it to And Osaka Suki I had. I had an old Osaka Suki and I said, well, I'd like to change it to the two commitment. And he said, that sure did. <coughs> Make sure the soil you're in is extremely well drained. Make sure that the soil stays the same dampness all the way through. Something that will grow that's the same dampness all the way through. You mix canuma with our soil. Canuma stays wet longer. Uh, and so you have wet and dry spots because you haven't really mixed it totally evenly. <coughs> okay, then we did away with the soil. Let's talk about fertilizer. Without exception for all varieties, chemical fertilizer makes the wood in the tree harder. When you use chemical fertilizer, you can, and, it, and it makes a tree grow fine, but it makes it harder. It's harder to bend. It's more apt to crack. If you use an organic fertilizer <coughs> that's got blood meal, bone meal, rapeseed, that kind of stuff in it, that has to ferment in the soil before the tree can use it, or that is pre-fermented, and that it's not immediate use, it's still got to go through another process in the soil, your, your truck, I mean, your, the wood in it is softer, and the bark on the outside is softer, and it will sprout, it will break back a lot more readily. That is particularly true of black pines. You can make black pines break back really good if you give them a couple of years of strong organic fertilizer, a lot of organic fertilizer. So, because because what you want to break back, you know, it's, it's put on new, new bark and new growth on top of that. And so this new bark on top is still soft. But most of us don't like organic fertilizer because it's too hard to do. Most of us have neighbors. Luckily, I don't have neighbors too close, but I had a visitor one time. <laughs> I had two dogs. The visitor came in. My daughter and I had made our fertilizer stuff. We put it in a five-gallon bucket. We covered it over. We set it in the sun. We let it ferment way out back. <laughs> for, for three weeks to a month. Then it was too hard to pack our galvanized can back there. So we brought it up near to the house and dumped the stuff in our, our, we have a big galvanized tray like this dumped it in there so we can let it dry and we can cut it in squares. We got Dennis, Dennis, uh, Denny Roche, Jerry Roche's brother, uh, Anyway, they came to the yard to look at some California junipers and something. They were people that I knew real well. And Jerry kept walking around and he'd scrape his feet out of the lawn. <laughs> And he'd look at his shoes, and he'd go off. Pretty soon he's scraping his feet on the lawn, and he'd look at his shoes. Finally he said to Janet, what is going on around here? And she says, I don't know. And he says, well, he said, you know, I thought I walked in something, but I can't find it. Well, we decided not. They got in the car and went. Janet walks out there, please, and she comes in the house just laughing like, I'll get out. She says, well, they parked next. <laughs> they parked over there by where we're drying the fertilizer. And though he didn't step in it, he could smell it, and he was sure it was on the shoes. <laughs> That's how strong that stuff is. So because we have an area, we can do it. But you can buy 
uh, fertilizer that's organic with with all the stuff in it, you know, that's not a liquid chemical. And if you if you want good growth and don't need anything breaking back, go ahead and use your chemical fertilizer. But on trees here, they're cattle. What we are basically here is hydroponic gardening. Do you ever think of that? A lot of fast drainage, something to hold the roots in place. And we're hydroponic gardening because with 80% uh, if you're doing 80% organic, uh, inorganic material, all it's doing is holding that thing in the pot. So it needs fertilizer every two weeks, maybe every week. Now, to know something about fertilizer, fertilizer works only when the temperature is over 40 degrees up until 90. So you guys get it worked all the time, not me by the 1st of June or 90. Fertilizer left in the soil over 90 degrees actually rots and can create root rot. In, 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 the, in the roots. So you don't give it any new fertilizer when you think it can't use it in, in two weeks it will be 90 degrees. Also in the winter time it's sitting there and it's filling in the soil and, and it's less, less than 40 degrees and it's filling in the soil and the tree isn't using it so it's going to waste and it's losing its strength so you don't want to uh, give it you know an all-purpose fertilizer when it's less when it's going to stay less than 40 degrees for a couple of weeks. In the fall, you want a zero tips in it before while it can still take up the nutrients. So that's my that's my say so on fertilizer. Any let me see, fertilizer soil, what else? Any suggestions on preventing that moss? Or with canuma. That green stuff on canuma might be moss, but it's also almost a form of uh, mycorrhiza. So the green is a growth, really bad. Oh, the other thing. This tree should have been covered with moss. Sphagnum moss, green moss, whatever you call it. I keep the, the, the package you buy it in says green moss in big letters. And everybody says, oh, you mean sphagnum moss. I didn't read sphagnum moss anywhere. I read green moss. <laughs> but it's that stringy stuff that you use to make uh, planter box things like that. You cut that up in quarter to half inch lengths with scissors. Cut, cut, cut because you want it about a quarter inch deep on this pot. Why? Because it is an insulator, number one. Number two, it prevents the soil from running out. From, from, if you overfill it, the soil tumbles out. The green moss, after you cut it, you put it in water and you wash it and take the little twigs out if there's any stuff take twigs. This is after you, when you repot it. This soil is totally dry when you repot. Always repot with dry soil. Because wet soil comes up, dry soil will fall in the cracks. Then with the soil dry, you put this wet sphagnum, lift it out with your fingers, pat it on the top at least a quarter inch thick. Then you water your tree. You water it until the water comes through the bottom clear. And you wait 20 minutes and you water it again. But that sphagnum moss wet on top of that dry soil, that dry soil actually pulls the fibers of the sphagnum down in the little cracks and it stays there. In Japan they grow the regular green moss over the top and you guys don't have any 
problems with Moscow, so I meant to talk to you about that. <laughs> but it will actually go over the top. But sphagnum moss is an insulator. And it keeps the tree from getting too cold. It keeps it from getting too, too hot. You say, I can't see if my tree is dry or not. In Japan, they don't look. They feel, this is dry. I hope somebody waters it tonight. This is dry. When, when, you, when it's dry, pick it up, feel how heavy it is, set it down. Put that in your mental bank. <coughs> Mm -hmm. Now, do you do that to all your plants or just to them? Well, see, you got to realize where I live. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I put it on everything. Because I live where it's hot. So I put it on my Japanese tables. Because see, where we live, we want water to be able to flow in. We don't have to worry about being too hard. <coughs> yeah, I know. I know that you want to water. <coughs> also, realize that that sphagnum moss has a hormone something in it because when you do root, when you do air layering, and all this other stuff, what do you put around there? Sphagnum moss. Not only because it holds moisture for that particular thing. Also because it's got a natural thing that stimulates roots. And you want as many fine roots up here on this soil surface as you can get. Azaleas do not have roots like maples or like junipers. Once you get them pruned, azaleas just have this mat that looks like a, a funny yellow sponge. And so you don't ever cut back into that mat and try to find heavy roots. You, you cut it into a pad, you cut up so that you can put new soil underneath the bottom of the truck. And you cut it flat enough so that it can go have some new soil on the bottom, have an inch to an inch and a half new soil around the edge and let those new roots grow up in there. You don't wedge it like, like some things you, you do. <coughs> but you've got to cut it so that that mat is tight because it's almost impossible to work soil into that mat because it's just fine, fine finger roots. And if you washed it out with a hose, you can't, cannot, get that soil back into that mat. And it grows new roots from that mat and not from this big thing up here. They don't have big roots like maples and junipers or mature sucks or keys and spit Like a, like a sponge, lots of little <coughs> teeny, teeny, teeny roots. You don't see a root this big down underneath this pad anywhere. And by the way, there's a hole right here somebody needs to fill. That's bothered me. I didn't see it earlier. I could fill it with a little bit of That's all right. So I'd like to see you if you take it when you take it home. If you've got some green moss, I'd like to see the green moss fit up around here, you know, so you can still see these roots, but but fit up around here as a protection and an encouragement for roots. So you don't feel that that should be repotted now? No. No, you do not repot when it's done this severe pruning. You can repot next year when you're taking out just the unnecessary stuff and and leaving these branches and you didn't bring it back quite this far. You do not repot the same year it blooms. 
So if it blooms, wait until after it blooms, let it gain its vigor again a little bit, and repot. But, but, but we most usually repot in the second of a, of a three-year stage, in the second year, if you're going to repot. Repotting is a controversial thing again. <laughs> it depends upon how root-bound it is, how vigorous you want it to grow. When it's left alone, it seems to grow a little faster, a little stronger. Gombus is three years. I wouldn't mind waiting till five if it starts pushing up out of the pot. It depends upon how, how fast the roots are growing in the bottom. It's growing fast enough that it's pushing this up and so that these feeder roots you need on the surface are in danger of drying out because they aren't down far enough and get off the bottom and do the edges and start over again. So that's about all I can think of if you have any more questions. So. Do you have any raffle tickets? You probably want to bring them up and put them in the camera.